Ja. Wall Street hedge fund managers 
who belong to an organization called Democrats for Education Reform. They can count on groups with names like Stand for Children, Education Reform Now, Education Equality Project, which just merged with Stand for Children. Uh, there's a the state can organization that's spreading. Uh, teach first, students first. They can count on the DC think tanks that are funded by the big foundations. And they can count on the corporate owned media to write friendly editorials echoing their ideas. They can count on Fox News. They can count on the Wall Street Journal. They can count on Republicans. They can count on Tea Party governors and legislatures. Unfortunately, they can also count on Secretary Barney Duncan. The only thing that they don't have on their side is truth. They don't have evidence. They can't point to any successes for their ideas. But facts, truth, evidence, experience, and logic don't count when there's so much money and power on one side of the debate. So what I plan to do this evening is to go over some of the evidence with you and to arm you with facts that you need to know. The other side will always have more money, but we must hope and believe that you can't fool all the people all the time. That was certainly true, as we saw just a few days ago in Ohio.
implode within five years. He said, there's just so far you can go without any evidence to support your claims. At a certain point, the public wakes up and realizes that the movement has two policy goals, and neither one of them will produce better education. Goal number one is privatization. The corporate reformers believe that the private sector is always better than the public sector. So they will do whatever they can to destroy public confidence in the public schools. They will talk endlessly about the crisis in public education. They'll publish books and articles and make movies and documentaries about our failing schools. They will make heroes of those who share their disdain for public schools and for public school teachers. They will make up fantastic tales about the superiority of private management. But one thing they will never do is to admit that research does not support these claims. Goal number two of the corporate reform movement is deprofessionalization. They don't believe that any preparation, preparation is needed to become a teacher, or for that matter, to become a principal or even a superintendent. They think that anyone should be allowed to teach because teaching, in their eyes, is not a profession, it's just a job. They want to remove every requirement that stands in the way of putting inexperienced people into these positions of responsibility. They'll discourage any precondition for employment in the educational profession is hoops and hurdles, it's an obstacle course. I'm waiting for them to say this about medicine, <laughs> or law, or flying an airplane. <clears throat> but the reformers don't see why teaching shouldn't be wide open to anyone. Anyone with a heartbeat and a college diploma, as Malcolm Gladwell put it in a New Yorker essay, they're not too sure whether you even need a college diploma. They're waiting for their favorite right wing economist to let them know. <laughs> <laughs> the corporate reformers say that teachers don't need certification, teachers don't need master's degrees. They say that teachers shouldn't be paid extra for experience. They say that teachers reach their peak in their third year. And after that, <laughs> and or has concentrated poverty 
and the OECD are Mexico, Turkey, and Poland. A shameful statistic. Reformers often say that the achievement gap is caused by bad teachers, not by poverty. We don't have to fix poverty, even let the schools do it. They say that three great teachers in a row will close the achievement gap. But some of their favorite economists say it's four great teachers in a row. That closes the achievement gap. And there are still others amongst their favorite economists who say it's five great teachers in a row. What they will never tell you, however, is that they cannot identify any district where this has actually happened. <laughs> In fact, what the economists do is what economists often do. They project that if one teacher can raise test scores by 10 points a year, then you can multiply that 10 points by 3 or 4 or 5. <laughs> that closes the gap. It works really well on paper, except no one has ever been able to figure out how to make it happen because you don't know until the school year is over whether you got the gains or you didn't get the gains. These gains are very unstable. And then there's solid loss and all sorts of other complications. If this speculation were, in fact, a real possibility, it should be happening across the charter sector. Because more than 90% of charters are non-union, as some people estimate it's more than 95% of charters. Charters can hire and fire teachers at will. But very, very few charters can claim that they close the achievement gap. And those few who do make this claim have extra funding, or high attrition rates, or a selection mechanism that limits the number of low-performing students, or the ability to throw out low-performing students. Corporate reformers often say that they believe so much in the importance of teachers. They want all teachers to be great teachers. But even though they say they believe in teachers, they don't really trust teachers. They don't trust principals to evaluate the teachers. So they've concluded that teachers and principals must be threatened and punished and incentivized. They advocate strategies that they believe will make teachers work harder because you're not working hard enough. <laughs> they give rewards to those who get higher test scores and they punish those who do not get higher test scores. And everyone is supposed to live in fear that their school will be closed if their scores don't go up. I remember uh, last year I was called in and asked about some <coughs> consulting firm that had a turnaround plan, and it had never actually turned many schools around, but it has a turnaround plan that it's managed to sell to several states. And so when the commentator from one of the NPR state, uh, stations asked me to read the plan and comment on it, I said, the plan consists of scaring schools and saying, if your scores don't go up, you're going to be closed. That's the plan. <laughs> and for that, they make a lot of money. Well, so what we have today is test scores that become the holy grail of education. But consider how these strategies work and don't work. Merit pay is one of the favorites of the corporate reform people. Merit pay has been tried again and again since the 1920s. It has never worked. Never, never worked. It has never improved student performance. Uh, just last year, we had the release from Vanderbilt University of the most thorough and exhaustive study of merit pay ever done in this country. It was a three-year study designed by economists at the National Center on Performance Incentives, and they had a test in Nashville, Tennessee. And their logic went like this. They said, you know, the reason that merit pay has always failed is because the rewards of three or four or five thousand dollars are not enough to really incentivize all those lazy teachers. <laughs> so uh, their plan offered a bonus of fifteen thousand dollars. That's pretty good in Nashville, Tennessee. You know, they don't probably don't make as much as you make in Seattle. I don't know what you, your pay is compared to theirs, but theirs is not great. Fifteen thousand dollars anywhere in this country is a nice size bonus. But after three years of slicing and dicing the test scores and everything else that happened, they found there between the control group and the experimental group, there was no difference at all. None. It was a waste. Uh, but the next day, the U.S. Department of Education announced it was going to allocate $500 million for merit pay plans across the country. <laughs> so you see, evidence doesn't matter. New York City is one of the great believers in all of this carrot and stick stuff. And so New York City, uh, the mayor, we have mayoral control, the mayor gave a very generous 
pension plan in exchange for school-wide bonuses based on test scores. Uh, that was tried for three years, and just this past spring, the program was suspended after $56 million had been spent because it made no difference, whatever, none. Merit pay doesn't work. It doesn't work because schools are by nature collaborative. Schools are communities. <coughs> teachers share what they know with other teachers. The work of the reading teacher is affected by the work of the history teacher, the science teacher, and every other teacher with whom the student comes into contact. Merit pay destroys collaboration. Merit pay destroys teamwork. It pits teacher against teacher in the competition for dollars. Of course, teachers would like to be paid more, should be paid more, but they don't want to work against one another. They know that it's wrong. Teachers 
It designed a long-term plan to raise the standards for entry into teaching. Teaching is now, in Finland, one of the most respected professions. Only one out of every ten people who want to be a teacher are accepted into teacher preparation programs. And every teacher in Finland has five years of preparation, not five weeks, five years.
It's a very nice idea. It brings in bright young people who stay for two or three years. Some of them will stay a little longer. But after two or three years, most of them are gone. This does not close the achievement gap. It diverts our attention from the deep changes needed to improve the profession. So now we come to the biggest issue of the corporate reform movement, which is evaluating teachers by student test scores. This represents the summation of the reformer belief that teacher quality is the most important cause of low performance and high performance because if students get low scores, presumably it's because they had bad teachers and if their scores went up, it's because they had great teachers. The Obama administration made this kind of teacher evaluation a cardinal element and raised to the top. So about half the states or more have now changed their laws to be eligible for race and top funding. Now dozens of states will be judging teachers based on whether their student scores go up or down. Their tenure, their reputation, and their job will depend on the test scores. I've been kind of curious about this notion of how do they know what number to use. In some states they say it's 50%, some states they say it's 40%. Frankly, they have no idea. 50%, 40%, 12% is just, you know, I can flip a coin and, and pick a percentage and that'll be it. What does the state legislature know about how to evaluate teachers? <laughs> now, in New York State, the uh, New York Board of Regents oversees many dozens of professions. You know, people who do, I guess, massage therapists and have accountants and everything else. And so I once said in the blog, sort of tongue in cheek, when they start doing value added for all those guys, I don't accept it for teachers. And one of the uh, teachers who wrote in said, don't suggest it. <laughs> <laughs> Most scholars of testing and accountability, thinking people like Linda Darlingham, Alan Ladd at Duke University, Jesse Rothstein at Berkeley, on and on, Edward Cardell at Stanford, all the great scholars of testing and accountability say, Value-added methods of assessment are not ready for high-stakes use. Most of them say that the measures are inaccurate, they're unstable, they're unreliable. That a teacher who's rated effective one year may be ineffective the next year, and vice versa. Most of them say that the ratings depend on many factors that are beyond the teacher's control. Students are not randomly assigned to teachers. Most say that the teachers may switch positions depending on which test is given and which, and which value added method you use. Beyond all these technical concerns, and they are many, there are genuine problems that ought to be taken into consideration and that are not. First of all, most teachers are not teaching tested subjects, so states have to figure out what to do about them. You may have read recently the story in the New York Times about the mess in Tennessee where teachers of non-tested subjects are being told to choose a subject and identify yourself with the scores of that subject. It's <laughs> true. It's true. You know, visit awesome. teachers and shop teachers who say, well, I want to do the English, and others will say, no, I prefer to go with the math scores. <laughs>
It's unhealthy to give one day a week of physical activity. Center, not 
Nazism, and it's gone. And then it had been split down the middle between East and West, and there was an ugly scar called the wall, and it's gone. There's no Stasi. People are happy, people are vibrant. You can't tell there ever was any of these abhorrent things. There are cycles of history, and the bad times end. And these bad times end, will end, and we must remain hopeful. We must stand up against this status quo. We must say what we believe. We must stand up for public education, which is the heartbeat of our community. We must stand up for the education profession, and we must stand up for the future of our democratic institutions.